So, welcome everyone to our conversation and question and answer about the documentary movie Silence Radio, presented as a cooperation of the International Documentary Film Fest Munich in the special edition of this year DocFest at Home and the Münchner Kammerspiele. Hello. Ah, okay, I don't know if you heard me now, so I will repeat again um, my welcome for you. So, um, hello um, everyone and welcome to our conversation and question and answer about the documentary movie Silence Radio. Um, and we present the movie as a cooperation of the International Documentary Film Fest Munich in the special edition of this year Doc Film Fest at Home and um, the Münchner Kammerspiele. My name is Julia Salzmann and I'm a dramaturg at the Münchner Kammerspiele and I'm very glad that tonight the director of Silence Radio, Juliana van Hul, is with, with us to talk about her movie and to answer my and the following questions. Um, a very warm welcome to Juliana. Hello, Julia. Hello, thank you. Juliana. Thank you so much for this very unusual Q&A, at least for me. But I'm very happy about the selection of the film in Dot München. I would love to be there, but here I am in my own bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so first of all, um, I want to present you shortly. Um, so oh, you study documentary here, at the EECTB, which is the International School of Film and Television in Antonio de los Baños in Cuba. And then you studied a master's degree in filmmaking in Switzerland. And your documentary Silence Radio, Muchachas and Si Seguimos Vivos have been screened at several international film festivals. And you also have directed for Al Jazeera and Swiss TV and have taught at film schools in Geneva and the Dominican Republic and Cuba. And um, currently, I don't know if this is still the case, you coordinate the documentary department at the e ECTV. So uh, do you find yourself right now uh, in Cuba still or where are you? So tonight I am in Geneva because I had to be uh, back home because of uh, the virus. So the school for the moment is not um, open. We still have some, some students who are trying to go back to the countries, but we are not in a class period and we are waiting for the situation to normalize and uh, wait until maybe fall to, to go back to a certain new normality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. Just as um, every university and school <laughs> is, uh, is doing. Yeah, yeah, nothing is really happening at the moment. Besides exactly. some online classes. <laughs> yes, the thing is that uh, the problem in Cuba is that uh, because of embargo, we don't really have uh, a powerful um, internet um, system. And so it's a bit difficult to, to program online uh, classes as oh, other yeah. universities are doing. And some of our students are now back in the countries, but some of our there so it's a little bit special our situation in in the film school in cuba oh, okay interesting um for now we have also um some participants in the conversation which will have the chance to um pose some questions later on um and if some of you did not yet have the chance to see the movie, um, I will just give a really short overview um, before we start the conversation. So, um, um, Radio Silence, the movie, um, is about um, the Mexican journalist Carmen Aristegui, which in March 2015 is dismissed from the radio station, MBS Radio, after the uncovering of a major corruption scandal involving Mexico's former president, Enrique Peña Nieto. Um, and um, in the so-called, the corruption scandal um, is called, was called the Casablanca or White House scandal and consisted in the building of a multi-million dollar mansion for the president by a government contractor. Um, and you, Juliana, you accompanied Carmen Aristegui in the um, month that followed and um, also 
the journalistic team of her um, building their own internet radio station in the fight against um, fake news censorship and a corrupt system of disinformation. And um, Juliana, your film Radio Silence is a very engaging and powerful portrait of a very courageous journalist and explains some of the contradict faces of Mexico through the figure of Carmen Aristegui. And at the same time, I had the impression that it seems like a very personal letter addressing with a lot of pain and despair and still always a lot of hope a country from a certain distance that is marked by political corruption and violence. So my first question would be what was your motivation to do the movie in the first place? Um, so as I tell it in the film I used to listen to Carmen's voice since, since I was a teenager and as many, many Mexicans uh, used to, to do. Uh, I used to listen to her, especially when I was in, um, in the car. And, uh, and I had the opportunity to move abroad and to, uh, to keep my studies in Switzerland. And I kept on listening to her through the internet. Uh, she was uh, trans broadcasting a very important news uh, program in this station, MVS, and uh, suddenly, in, the, in a moment very complicated for the Mexican uh, uh, history, uh, as we were seeing a huge uh, wave of violence uh, eating our country, uh, some of the of, uh, peasant students, uh, so some uh, started missing, uh, a lot of people were killed, a lot of, a lot of journalists were, were killed, and, uh, and at that moment, uh, suddenly, this voice disappeared. Um, so that, of course, got me very angry, and, uh, and from the distance, I decided to do something, to do something for this country that I love, that I was very nostalgic of, and uh, and um, it was a way to find our words back because uh, I, I was feeling that I was uh, getting speechless uh, seeing all this violence uh, going on in Mexico. I couldn't really find the words to, to tell what was happening to us. And on top of that, suddenly we lost Carmen's voice and it was like, for me, it was like losing my words twice. And so this is like the, the motivation of the film in the beginning, to try to, 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 to find words, um, to try to find Carmen back, to try to protect her in some way, because uh, she was already so well known uh, that for me it was um, a symptom that things were going really bad in Mexico. If that, this was happening to Carmen, it meant that very bad things were happening to other journalists. And uh, so this is how it all started in March 2015. And, uh, and well, the rest of the story is told in the film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then you were like traveling back and forth because you said you were not living in Mexico anymore at that moment. So you went yes, to Mexico I and then back. So the film was also in a process of moving um, to a distance and then coming back to Mexico? That's right. Um, at that moment, I didn't know exactly uh, how, um, how close I was going to get to Carmen, what the access was going to be. I didn't know her before that. So um, the first thing I did is I approached uh, some Swiss producers and told them just the situation. Uh, not knowing exactly what the end, the, the end of the, the story would be. And uh, I went to Mexico and I met her after many months of trying to, to find her. It wasn't easy because of the situation at that time. It was dangerous and many people in Mexico at that time were uh, taking care. And, um, and, but finally I found her and she agreed. She said, yes, let's do the movie. But we, none of us really knew what the movie was gonna be. But I work in this uh, style or in this form of uh, creative documentary, which is actually 
um, the, the footprint of, uh, of the encounter. I believe in cinema as this, as a, as a footprint, uh, or as a, as a print of the encounter. And so, and so um, things were uh, going on and, and, uh, and letting us know what the way of the film uh, was taking and was going to be. And so after a step of uh, getting more confident uh, with Kahneman and the, the, uh, the, our, relation, uh, our relation was uh, more and more open, uh, I kept on doing this back and forward uh, to Switzerland, basically to find um, the um, the money <laughs> to keep on living and to and to and to pay my crew and to do the film and uh, and it all uh, became a, a story of uh, four years of uh, of work uh, near her. And how did that? Um, I found it really interesting how you explained it. You try to um, build up a relation. To Carmen, um, did you have a lot of conversations in the beginning? Because the film seems more that um, it seems more that you accompany her, that you are more like in the back, um, and just one scene is a direct conversation with her. I definitely wanted to show her uh, differently than what people in Mexico, especially, but in Latin America, were already used to see her. That means a, a talking head. And uh, so even though we had many conversations uh, in the background, I tried to privilege uh, the scenes and to film her just being herself. I was trying to, to draw the portrait of this woman in this situation. And I wanted to uh, to reveal her and to show her in the most uh, realistic situations as possible. So, uh, so I decided, of course, to to uh, film her during her job. Uh, it was intended that uh, her privacy was going to remain private, and uh, and I tried to film as much as possible during the work time, which for somebody like Carmen <laughs> means twenty four seven. <laughs> She's a real workaholic. <laughs> um, in the movie, um, there are um, a lot of voiceover scenes which are composed of um, poetic words and regularly they come up um, accompanied by shots of Mexico City streets um, filmed out of the car or sometimes from a bird's eye view. Um, how was the process of creating that part? So how did you introduce um, and construct the text in the film? And um, beside that, what role did the city shots play for you? So the idea of uh, writing a voiceover came very early uh, in the project because uh, Carmen's story was, story was so well known by so many Mexicans that for me it was very important to tell my own story because otherwise uh, it was very difficult to put all the information and all the facts that belong to that big story. So for me, uh, this was important to make it uh, subjective, <laughs> even though you cannot make, make an objective film, but um, towards my own voice to, to tell those emotions. Uh, for me, it was important to, to transmit that um, the, the emotions that I was feeling during all the process. And, um, so finding the tone was uh, something I started doing at the beginning of the editing and it was uh, uh, work I did uh, hand by hand with my editor because uh, it's difficult to listen to your own voice and to find the right words. And uh, one thing I did in the beginning was to get inspired by uh, some authors, uh, some uh, poets and some writers uh, very well known in Mexico one of them uh, is um, Cecilia, a well-known poet who had lost his uh, teenager son in a terrible um, um, 
kidnap and killing. And he uh, decided to quit poetry because of uh, how painful the situation was. But after some years, he ended up by publishing uh, an amazing uh, novel, uh, which is uh, actually her autobiography, uh, which um, uh, I've, I've got into my, my hands at some point and I wasn't able to finish it because it is so, so painful. But uh, for sure, it helped me finding the tone of, uh, of so much pain, um, even though it has nothing to do uh, losing a, a child than uh, what I was feeling for the country. But, uh, but in some way, it helped me uh, finding the words for this tragedy we were living uh, in Mexico. Another referent, of course, was for me George Orwell. We were uh, have experiencing the feeling of being in under surveillance by the government, uh, something that is very well written in in a book called uh, 1984. And uh, and of course, George Orwell really inspired me. There is a scene that uh, I wanted absolutely to be part of the film, which uh, is the uh, police operator, operating room where they, each policeman is in front of a, of a computer, of a screen, uh, watching and controlling one of the surveillance cameras that are in the city. And, uh, and for me, it was amazing to have that image uh, while rereading 1984, because it was exactly the image that uh, the big brother <laughs> uh, was, uh, uh, and th that we were feeling. We were, um, each time we texted, for example, with, with Carmen or with someone from her team, we were very careful about how, what words we were using. And, uh, and I really had this, um, this feeling that um, some kind of paranoia, but that was actually confirmed by investigations that the own Carmen published. And, uh, so for sure, George Orwell, and then Octavio Paz, who is uh, the most, for me, the most magnificent writer in, uh, in Mexican literature, and who has inspired not only this film, but the previous film I did, um, Muchachas, who was actually uh, screened in Doctors München five years ago. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I believe Octavio Paz is one of the few Mexican who's able to find the words to describe such a complex uh, country as Mexico is. So, so they are uh, quote <laughs> and uh, in, my, in my text because, uh, uh, but uh, this way was the way. And then you write, you record and you try and you go back and you try further and then you have to sleep and you have to wait five days. And then one day you see again the montage and you say, this doesn't work and then, uh, it's it's a never-ending story, actually, w uh, working with a voiceover. But I believe it's a fascinating tool. And the decision for the city pictures, like basically yes. having a, a picture of Mexico City as a city that is so many streets and so many cars, which were like most of the pictures. So as I told you in the beginning, I used to listen to Carmen when I was in the car. When you live in a city so big as Mexico City, which uh, has uh, more than 20 million people, and I don't know how many million cars, but many million cars, you spend a lot of your day in, the, in, in traffic jams. And uh, Carmen's program used to start very early in the morning and it was a three or four hour show. And so we were already going to university, but in the beginning for me to school, then to university, then just to work because you spend a, an hour or two in the morning to get where you're going. And that was the experience for many Mexicans. We were used to listen to Carmen in the morning while traveling in mm -hmm. dark cars and or in a taxi cab or in the bus or just Carmen's voice was there. So for me, it came very naturally just to film those streets and to be during that moment where her voice was absent. And when I was feeling orphan of that voice, um, and, then, and then that's it. it, it came very naturally. A friend of mine 
uh, came to one of the screenings in Mexico a month ago, and he told me that for him uh, to see some of the images of the city empty of cars, which are very uh, rare images to see because you always have cars. Maybe right now in confinement, it's different. <laughs> But before uh, COVID-19, it was just impossible to imagine the city with that, without cars. And for him, uh, he told me that this was like the, the somehow the love letter to, to Carmen, to uh, without her voice, the city was empty of cars. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it wasn't intended. <laughs> I'm more pragmatic. <laughs> um, some of the messages that come and receives via social media are heavily sexually loaded. So she sometimes got aggressive messages that attack a woman in a, in a way that a man would never have been attacked. So they are disrespectful, especially about a woman having her own voice and her own strong opinion. So I was wondering um, what you think about the partic particularities of being um, like a female journalist, but also asking you now, um, a female filmmaker in a country that is so machista and um, that which are the partic particular challenges that you confront performing your prof profession as a filmmaker? Well, that's a difficult question. Uh, well, the attacks against women uh, in Mexico and Latin America, but and the world are now <laughs> every day are more known. But uh, of course, women have been victims of this uh, in the whole story of humanity. And uh, I believe, especially women with power, as uh, it is Carmen's case, uh, it is a very uh, common way to to attack. Uh, women in power, as if uh, men didn't like that. Uh, Carmen used to used to say that uh, we women have to first uh, um, uh, demonstrate that we're not uh, dumb, that we're not stupid, and then start talking. <laughs> And then we start talking or doing or act, acting, but we have to demonstrate that we're not stupid first, and then you, we have we can be. And men don't have to go through that through that step. Um, in case of uh, of journalism, for sure, it is uh, it is a handicap because uh, n not only already being a journalist implies that you have to work under very very dangerous circumstances and under a lot of pressure. But if you are a woman, you have to do you have to to to, to uh, inf go uh, through the double of uh, the situations. So uh, that's uh, a reality, and um, and of course in in cinema and in other professions where uh, where women are not uh, historically been there, um, we get uh, we get some aggressions. Uh, I believe the documentary world is a little bit more. Um, subtle and because there are more women filmmakers in in the documentary world and uh, but in the film industry in generally uh, we don't do we don't film as much as men we don't uh, work as much as them we don't get the 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 budgets as high as men so um, so the, the competition is really hard and we have to work a lot to find our own place to do our work and to remain uh, doing it. Uh, I haven't uh, been a victim of uh, gender attack. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't, I, I couldn't say more, but uh, because I know how difficult it is, the characters of my films are women I believe I have a responsibility as a woman filmmaker to point my camera to another woman uh, because uh, we have to, to help each other to raise our voice and to find our place in society. Um, it already has been a while since you filmed the movie. Um, 
I don't know if you have still been in contact with Carmen, but um, maybe in general, uh, you know about other journalists and their situation and if it has changed um, also with the new president, Andres Manuel Obrador, who is in power since 2018. Um, have there been any changes for journalists or um, what do you know about that? So the new president uh, took uh, power in the 1st of December 2018. So it's uh, relatively recent, the new government. There was a lot of hope. I was there uh, for the election day and there was a lot of hope for all the Mexican society uh, believing that a change was possible, not only for journalists and for freedom of uh, expression and press, but for just security in general. And, uh, and things have changed, but maybe not the way we expected. It's been, it's been too, it's too early to say, and we, have, we will have to wait and see to make the bilan. However, uh, numbers show that uh, the murders haven't really stopped, and that is shameful for the new government because uh, not only, of course, the head of the, the president changed, but mostly the whole uh, uh, paysage of the country, of the political uh, country changed. So, so they are in power now and things should be changing by now. But uh, journalists in the countryside are still getting attacked and murdered and uh, doing their job. So it's still very, very complicated. The, the thing that has basically changed is the relationship between the president and the press, because he, um, he has now a spot in the morning of a couple of hours where he attends press. So it's uh, just a, uh, a press um, Q and A possibility where all the, the journalists are there and they can ask whatever they want to the president. So that's amazing. I mean, that is re really a, a privilege and uh, and um, a, a space that was needed. However, I don't believe the journalists are asking the right questions, and uh, and I don't believe, of course, that's um, that's enough. So um, so besides that, we are actually in this week, we are starting to see that uh, some, uh, some attacks from the government are uh, going through bots and internet uh, messages to uh, some, of, uh, some of the media. Uh, Aristegui's uh, website is one of the victims. And so, uh, so of course, things in where the, situa the political situation is so rotten as it is actually in Mexico, it is very complicated to expect a quick change. The cartels are, have, have taken to complete control of the, of the governments. We don't know now who is who. So that's very complicated to change from one day to another. Mm -hmm. And um, at um, already talking about um, being threatened and being in fear of something happen happening to oneself because of the work one does. Um, I had um, the impression seeing the film that um, Carmen Aristegui in the movie seemed most of the time relieved of fear or that each obstacle in her way lets her even get even more strength or strengthen to her conviction and just one scene maybe um, fell out of it where she reports about the murder of her colleague um, um, Javier Valdez and then she is visibly shocked and puts her hands in front of her face and um, contrasting to her there are some of her colleagues that um, say that um, or admit that they also are taking antidepressants because they are not able to deal with the permanent anxiety anxieties. So I was interested in how did you experience um, the fear in the process of making the film as something that is um, part of the daily lives of the journalists you were with? And also beside that, um, how did you experience fear yourself? Because 
at one point you say that also your apartment locks, if I understood it right, um, were tempered when you came back from the US where you were with Carmen um, at the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Mm -hmm. So um, connected to that, the questions if, if documentary makers are also at risk, like is it just something limited to journalists or does it also affect um, other areas um, that deal with the publication of violation of human rights? Yes, many activists and defenders of human rights have been uh, victims of attacks. So that is a common, uh, that, that's a regularity in Mexico, very sadly. Uh, when I arrived in, in Mexico to look for Carmen and when I was, I started to, to get the temperature of the ambience in her uh, office, uh, the feeling I, I had is what I tried to transmit in the film. Uh, there, was, there was fear, um, there was a lot of pressure because there was a, a real danger. Uh, in, in May uh, 2017, Javier Valdez was shot and killed, and he was also a very well-known um, journalist, not only in Mexico, but in the international scene, because he knew a lot of information about the Sinaloa cartel, which was one of the biggest cartels, drug cartels in Mexico, and anyone in the world who would would uh, like to know about the cartel had to contact somehow uh, uh, Javier Valdez. So he had a reputation internationally and uh, the fact that he got killed like that uh, was also very very shocking for everyone in Mexico because uh, because he was visible. So of course uh, Carmen um, Carmen at some point, I believe, and uh, I believe she th she thinks that too was protected by her visibility, and uh, she is so well known in Mexico that she had to go further and further and further. It, it was more complicated and more dangerous just to do one step uh, behind or just to stop, because the more visible she was, the more protected maybe she was. Also, the problem is that her team. Uh, is not as visible, uh, obviously, and so maybe that's what uh, transparents in their words when I interview them is that fear because um, nobody really cares. I mean, of course, in, uh, if uh, if they disappear, so they are in different challenges than someone uh, like Carmen who is so so visible. Um, I, I'm not sure that just that filmmakers are systematically attacked. Of course, it has to be with the subject you are uh, treating. But uh, we now know that our government bought this uh, system of surveillance called Pegasus, who's actually built to surveil terrorists. <laughs> uh, and journalists or filmmakers are not terrorists, and they are using it to surveil the wrong people. And um, and uh, what happened to me is uh, just that we we were followed, and I'm sh I'm no we were followed because uh, many drivers of our the production van we uh, used to hire at each moment we went to Mexico told me after a couple of uh, weeks I'm sorry but I have to tell you that today we were followed by blah blah. So I started to make uh, notes on a notebook and it always had to do when a moment we were uh, with Carmen in a public place uh, because she was in a conference and we were shooting because we were having lunch at the middle of the day and just then we went back to our uh, my place because it was a production uh, uh, headquarters and uh, so it of course they were they were uh, surveilling her and for me it was uh, very important that my rushes were safe that was my my main concern in the, during all the process because uh, I was getting access 
through to some very delicate investigations Carmen was doing at that time. And uh, I had everything in my hard drive. And uh, in case that uh, came to wrong hands, it could be very dangerous for her. And for sure, I didn't want to. And, and that meant the end of everything, the meant of the investigation, the meant of the end of my relation with her and her team the, and the end of my film. So it was very important to me that the rushes were safe. We approach uh, the Swiss embassy in Mexico and ask for help and just to be in standby in case we needed uh, a place to put the hard drive and, um, and to send that hard drive uh, to Switzerland and maintain the rushes safe. Fortunately, we, weren't, uh, we didn't need to use that call. And, um, and the, the thing that happened is that after our first public shooting, which was in, in Washington, as you mentioned, uh, I, I came back home and uh, one Sunday I arrived in the morning after buying bread or whatever, and somebody had tried to, to open my apartment. Mm -hmm. I can't say right now that it was linked to my work. However, it's not an apartment that they tried to rob every Sunday. Mm -hmm. So you make links, of course you do. Mm -hmm. And it made me think uh, things twice. We had many, many talks with my producers, uh, the Swiss producers, of course, who were concerned about sending a team uh, in Mexico, but my Mexican producers who uh, were in the field and were also concerned in, if anything was, uh, could happen. And uh, we discussed every step we did. I can tell you we discussed everything after, even after the, the editing of the trailer because we point at some some special figures, <laughs> some uh, not very sympathetic men <laughs> in, the, in the film, and they are, uh, they are potential um, audience of the film. So, uh, so we didn't want the attacks to, to go uh, after, to, to continue after the screening or the, the premiere of the film. Nothing has happened, but uh, I can tell you I feel more safe here in, in Geneva right now because in the middle of the process I got pregnant, I had a little baby and there definitely things change in terms of your courage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I would like right now to invite everyone that is um, participating to um, um, pose a question if you have one or make a commentary um so i think you should be able to talk right now you can also put your videos on so we can also see you that would be quite nice <laughs> So is there someone who wants to pose a question to Juliana? Should I read it? <laughs> yeah, we have commentary so we can, yes. So uh, Michael says, Carmen seems to be totally fearless. Did you ever experience her losing her temper <laughs> or getting afraid? Uh, no, I have, I have to say she is in total control uh, because, um, because she's very experienced, because it wasn't the first time uh, she was in, difficult, in such a difficult situation. Uh, I believe she is just amazing in terms of uh, how courageous she is. I know she is used to perform for television and that she knows very well the work with the camera. But there were many, many moments uh, where I wasn't shooting and uh, she didn't lose her temper. What, uh, what I can say is that we were in New York when she found, when she, she knew or she learned, sorry, that, um, that they had rubbed the office. 
I don't know, well, the people who saw the, the film, there's this scene which is uh, in, shot by the security cameras of her office and we can see two men actually entering the office and they just robbed a computer. That was maybe the moment uh, because I was uh, learn she was learning it live that I saw her a little bit more concerned. <laughs> <laughs> than usual because it was because it was happening at that moment 10 minutes later it was over and she was already in control but i could see something that was uh because she was not in mexico and because that that experience uh, was accompanied accompanied by a campaign of uh memes of just uh, things that appear in social networks uh that said that she that people that the militars had entered her place so that was a little bit uh, and an image of a van that i show at some point that also that had been shot so it was a little bit too much just a couple of people entering in a sunday morning in her office and then those images the militars at home, not having the possibility to confirm that this wasn't uh, real or true, and the image of this van, which was actually uh, like the, very much like her own car with shots, uh, it was uh, it, it was a moment of uh, certainty of, of confusion and of fear, and she decided to to call over and over and over the people who who were in Mexico at the time to, to try to understand what was going on, uh, what was the investigation, or which were the investigations that were in the, in the notebook that the people, that the robbers took, to try to understand who had sent them. For her, that this was the way to link and to try to know uh, who had sent them what were the investigations they were working on and that were in that computer. That's as much as I saw and I can confirm I was there a lot of time with her. I mean, and that's why in the film there are no more scenes like, like that. She's a perfectionist. Uh, there's a scene where she was struggling to get the program back on air and she was struggling with her team. Uh, they were not ready, things were not easy to do. Etc. And uh, there's this scene just before the, the going back on air again, where she's a little bit more tough to them. That was as much as I could see. That doesn't mean she's not very imponent and that I was scared of her. <laughs> um, Michael is um, asking um, additionally, how many times did you lose your temper during shooting the film? <laughs> well, I believe just as in every film, uh, you have to say that you quit. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise you don't go through the whole experience. You have to hate this. You have to say, but why am I not an engineer or a lawyer or just a translator or whatever? Because you, you have to hate this job to love it. And, uh, and of course, I went through this many, many times. I have to say, I lost my temperature with my producers <laughs> a lot more than with my characters. And that is just something very common between filmmakers and producers in any project. <laughs> <laughs> they push you so hard and <laughs> we believe they don't understand anything. And after some months you say, okay, shit, you were right. <laughs> There is a question or commentary. Um, I feel a lot of Pilar, um, okay, the Dominguez name. maybe. Yeah. Um, I feel a lot of respect for you, Carmen Aristegui and her team. You all are very brave. Is Carmen's son still living in the USA? It must be hard for her not to have her son close to her, I guess. It was very hard for her. Uh, we spoke about that many, many times. Um, it, 
she told me it wasn't a decision uh, made for having him uh, secure and abroad in the, in the US. However, at that moment when he left, everything started. So it ended up by being uh, a good thing. And, uh, and of course it was, it was hard, I believe not only for her, but for him. Uh, but uh, now he's back. She has told that to, to the media, so it's not a secret. He is studying in Mexico, and, uh, and I believe that things have changed uh, for Carmen in this, uh, in th during this term. So that's it. I don't know if you saw it, but there was um, a commentary which is more a compliment um, from um, someone in the beginning who said i am very impressed with your work mexico and everyone needs more people as brave as you i have a lot of respect and i hope you can make more important documentaries thanks for sharing this story greetings from germany thank you so much mm -hmm. it is it is great to to get the reactions of the audience i would love to be in a theater of course and to be able to see uh you <laughs> but um but we filmmakers are really nourished by the comments of uh, the audience after so many years of work so it really means a lot to me and my team you had at the beginning the chance to show it at some film festivals and um, before there was the lockdown am i right yes we had a beautiful premiere in zurich festival in the beginning of october then we were able to go to itfa in amsterdam in november and carmen was there with us and then the film uh, did a, a beautiful career. I wasn't able to go to every festival because I was in Cuba, as I, as I told you. And then we were able to do the premiere in Mexico in March. And uh, after a couple of screenings, everything uh, ended. So uh, there we, we all had to go and, and confine. But we were able to, to do the, a, a small premiere in Mexico in a beautiful festival of the uni National University called FICUNAM. And then we, a couple of weeks ago, we also did the premiere of Ambulante, this very big documentary uh, festival uh, in Mexico in her version online this year. And uh, we were the opening uh, documentary, so, so it was amazing. Carmen was there and, uh, and it was a very nice uh, session too. That's nice to hear. Is there um, any more question? Because we are coming to an end. Um, so if someone still wants to ask something, um, now is the chance. I would like to say that we have uh, wonderful uh, distributors in Germany, which is amazing. And so uh, we are just waiting for the theaters to open and we would like to, um, to tell the people to come to the theaters whenever this happens and to when whatever those theaters will be, because uh, I believe we need to fight for cinema and uh, especially in this moment that we, we need to fight for the theaters and for independent cinema in the theaters so um, I would like to to tell to the people even the 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 audience of the of the festival who saw already saw the, the film online to go to the theater or to tell about the film if uh, if there is a possibility in a theater near them that's a nice call and um, so since we didn't get another question right now, um, I want to thank you very much, Juliana, for your you. time and your participation. And it was super interesting to be able to talk to you directly about thank your movie. Thank you so, so, so much, Julia. And thank you to all the organizers of the festival. I believe it's, a, it's tough to suddenly go online and you have, we have to learn a lot of, about it, but I believe it's worth it. Uh, next time you have more experience and we all will, and, and we have to go and, and, and push the accelerator <laughs> to, this, to this new era. <laughs> That's right. So also from my side, thanks a lot to the Doc Film Fest for the cooperation that made possible that we can show the movie in the space of Kammer 4 from the Kammerspiele. And um, thanks everyone who saw the movie and listened. And um, 
see you soon, hopefully. Thank you very much and have a wonderful night. The same for you. Take care, Julia. Ciao, ciao. Bye, bye.